And we should have closed captioning working now. As always. Okay. Good. Well, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shelley Lapkoff. You can see her there on her screen. And uh, she is just a stone's throw actually out my back door. We are neighbors. And she so graciously accepted uh, my invitation to come and, and talk with you guys tonight a little bit about the Enlightenment from a different perspective. And the perspective that she's going to take is from one of numbers and science. And uh, here's a little bit of her bio so you know about uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Lapkoff. Shelley uh, Lapkoff earned a PhD in demography and an MA in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. She started her consulting career while she was a graduate student. She sometimes testifies in court cases and discrimination cases, helps sites uh, when they need to do political redistricting and uh, forecast enrollments for school districts. And, uh, and so has a, a very busy career uh, and uh, I, I just wanted to get started here a little bit, and maybe Shelley, you could tell us about what a demographer does, and and what do you do with all of that data that you collect? Right. You know, a lot of people say they've never met a demographer before, um, so we're kind of a rare breed. We look at population trends. You know, demography is a study of population. So population trends, the size of the population, anything that would affect the size like births, deaths, uh, migration. Uh, COVID is, a, for example, I have some demography friends who early on, like the first month COVID hit, they were doing seminars on, on predicting how many deaths, not that this is a happy, happy thing, but how many deaths they expected to see in the US. Um, and how it would play out and what was gonna, what would take to change, uh, change our situation. So it, there's a lot of different avenues you can go and talk about with demography. Like my bio said, sometimes I work on discrimination cases. Sometimes I'm working with school districts, helping them decide how many students they're gonna have. So it's very wide ranging. So uh, what, what drew you to demography? Are you a numbers person? Uh, yeah, I am a numbers person. Uh, and also I like that it, it often gives a big picture of things, a long view. Um, because just by the nature of humans, we live 80, 100 years and we can predict trends over time. So we're predicting things like when I was just starting out in my 20s, we knew that the baby boom generation was gonna retire and that was gonna make a big shift. So we, people can study what's gonna happen when a big cohort retires and leaves the workforce. So finally, that's happening uh, in my life. The baby boomers have gotten to the point where we're almost retired. Some, some have, some are about to. So yeah, I like taking that broad view of things. <laughs> and so what kind of projects are you working on today besides this, this lecture? Well, right now, as maybe some of you remember, you took a census about six months ago or a year ago now, and uh, we're gearing up. There's a lot that happens when the census data comes out, and so we're gearing up for that. Uh, in particular, all these people who elect by district, like the Congress, everybody has to redistrict based on the new census data. And that includes city councils and school districts and water boards. And uh, they're gonna be like 500 different boards that have to redistrict in California. So we're gearing up for that. Yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah, a lot of work. It sounds like a lot of numbers to crunch. Yes. <laughs> a lot of Excel spreadsheets, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you for being here tonight. And um, yeah. is there is there anything you'd like to talk about before we get started? Or do you just want to jump I in? We should just get started because I'm not quite sure how long this is going to take. Okay. I have a bunch of fun slides. So let me start sharing my screen on that. Let's see if you all see that. Can you see that? Yes, okay. it's good. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, really a pleasure. I had to study up on the Enlightenment period, and it is such an amazing period in human history. It was really fun to research this. And um, tonight, uh, I'm going to start with a historical perspective, because that's the long view. Like, why did the Enlightenment period happen? How did it arise? And it turns out it's a very interesting a set of events. And by showing you the history, it contrasts so dramatically with the Enlightenment period. And then I had to choose who to talk about. There's so many people to talk about, but I chose the first demographer, the father of demography, had to talk about him, and uh, John Locke and Voltaire, the political satirist. Uh, I had to talk about John Locke because we might not have our American democracy without John Locke. Uh, the writings of John Locke. And then I chose Voltaire because he's so fun. He, his writing is very witty and he might even be considered the father of political satire. He was also the most popular of the Enlightenment thinkers uh, by the time he died. So uh, those are the three and through them, I hope you'll get a sense of what the Enlightenment period was like. I'll end with summarizing some of those socioeconomic demographic forces that are that come through by the stories of these three men. So let's get started with that historical perspective. I'm starting with the fall of Rome, 476 AD, a long time ago, but it's important because when Rome fell, there was anarchy. There was no central government and the world was a dangerous place. Europe was being attacked from the north and the east and the south, and people needed protection. Um, as a result, we have what became, become, become, has become known as the Middle Ages, or medieval times, or the Dark Ages. Um, it actually lasted a really long time, 900 years, and it was a very brutal, very dangerous time in our life. And there were two institutions that were important for the people to just stay alive. Um, and they're gonna get a really bad rap in the enlightenment period. So I just wanna give them a, their fair share, their, their fair shake here. Um, the Roman Catholic Church was, provided some order and some control and some mental uh, stability to the people during this time of anarchy. And the second institution that developed during this time is feudalism. There is a king and nobles, uh, basically people aligned with their, with the most powerful neighbor that they had. Uh, and then this ultimately resulted in a king who was the most powerful person and on down the line. And people, as I understand it, voluntarily went into this system. It was a good deal for the peasants and serfs when they started because they needed protection. Um, and so they were willing to give up a lot for that protection. But the problem was this lasted too long, 900 years, and there was no upper mobility, no opportunity to advance yourself, advance your children, and it was a very, very unequal system. And while I know it's sometimes considered a romantic time, with knights and kings, uh, I want to remind people that 90% of the population were these peasants and serfs, and it was not a happy life uh, for most of them. So that, that was um, the situation for 900 years. And the question I asked is why did this break down? What, what changed this feudalism and also the strength of the Roman Catholic Church? And by the way, the Roman Catholic Church owned between a third and a half of the land in Europe during this time. So they were very powerful economically as well as psychologically. Well, here's where there's a surprise of what 
as a demographer, I see it as one of the key ingredients that ended this system and made way for the Enlightenment period. And that is the Black Death or the bubonic plague. In 1350 is the center of it. Uh, a third of Europe's population died. That is huge. And this did two things. One is the Roman Catholic Church was dependent on, people trusted it, they believed in it. And when the plague hit, people said, where is God? The church is not helping us. And this is horrific, a horrific time. So there was a little chink in the church at that point. And the second, from an economist's point of view, because so many people died, labor became scarce and land became abundant. And this shifted the power of the peasants. They now had bargaining power. They also could migrate and nobody was going to look the other way. Uh, they, they, and they did negotiate. If they didn't like what somebody was offering them, they went a little ways away and they could uh, make a better deal. So the Black Plague, ironically, helped help the 90% of those peasants of that population. Another factor was the printing press in 1440. Before the printing press, the only people that were really literate were the clergy. When the printing press and, and the elite, when the printing press happened, it allowed for a lot of books to be disseminated and the population eventually became literate. And similar and uh, related to that, the other thing that happened was the Protestant Reformation. Um, Martin Luther uh, had an amazing impact in objecting to the abuses of the church. And one of the things that happened is that because of the printing press, he was able to disseminate a Bible in German. They used to all be in Latin, so in German. And many people could now read the Bible for themselves. So individuals ended up having their own relationship with God. They did not have to depend on the Catholic Church. So those three things were key in changing uh, the hold of the church and this feudalism. Um, and as a result, we had the Renaissance uh, in the 1400 to 1600 and the scientific revolution of the 1600s. And the scientific revolution was especially important for the enlightenment period. The scientific revolution said, we can solve our own problems. We can use science and reason and work through things. We can, dis, uh, we can uh, determine the laws of physics and the laws of nature. And this was gonna spill over into the enlightenment period because the enlightenment period was saying, we wanna understand the laws of human society. What are those laws? And they're using the same kind of reasoning that arose in the scientific revolution. Okay, so that's the long view. And now I wanna go on to the three men that I wanna talk about. Uh, and first, uh, Thomas Malthus. Now, I'm sure he's not on everybody's top three list of enlightenment thinkers, but um, he's actually still being, his theories are still being discussed today. And they're controversial. They were controversial then, and they're controversial now. And I'll explain why um, in a minute. Uh, he wrote his essay on the principle of population in 1798. Um, and he's known as having a really pessimistic view. This is really different from the other Enlightenment thinkers who are very optimistic and trying to figure out how can we best organize society? Um, but Malthus uh, had 
was, was looking at the numbers. He was looking at a lot of different things and uh, came up with uh, a concern, which we still have today. He was the first one that was concerned about population growth. And I have um, a little chart here that explains his key theory that people, again, are still talking about today, not just demographers, but other people too. <laughs> um, he basically said population grows exponentially. Um, and we see that, I think most people know, like we've, we've gone crazy right now. We have 7.5 billion people on the planet. We only had less than a billion when Malthus was around. But meanwhile, he believed food production is only gonna go linearly. So in times of abundance, so this green line is the food production. When time is abundant, you have more food than population. People are going to respond by having more children. And there's going to be increased population growth. So much so that the population is going to overtake the food supply. And when that happens, then you're going to have crisis, war or famine or disease, there'll be more, there'll be ways that the population will have to come down again. Um, this ended up being controversial just because one of the things that meant is, it sounds cruel, but he's, he was against the poor laws and he was against charity because he said, if you just improve the poor, they're just gonna have more children and then there'll be more of a population of poor people and that's gonna be a problem. So you, you, can't, uh, you can't help the poor by giving them more money. Uh, let's see. So here are some of the things that he was seeing. Uh, there was an agricultural revolution during the enlightenment period, uh, especially in England. And they had a lot of innovation. They suddenly found out about crop rotation. And so they could, um, they could have more food for the same amount of land. There were more, uh, Jethro Tull had developed a plow. Uh, and then they had this, these enclosed fields. So what happened there, instead of individual peasants doing their little farming, the fields were enclosed and they could be more efficient when they were farming. And this turned out to be important, not just because more food was grown, but it meant the peasants were kicked off the land. So there was a lot of migration out of, these, um, out of the countryside into the cities. And I want to show you, I think my next slide, yes, my next slide shows you these numbers of the population in London. And what you can see is there was this huge increase in London's population. Um, it, in 1500, 50,000 population, a century later, 1600, 187,000. So almost a fourfold increase. Then in 1700, basically the start of the Enlightenment period, 550,000 people in London. And by 1800, the end of the Enlightenment period, 861,000. So you can see this mass migration from into London. And the other cities in Europe were similar. Uh, in, uh, London was by far the largest by 1800, but um, before 1800, Paris was actually the most populated city. Uh, in 1700, uh, Paris and London were about the same, but, and, and before that time, Paris had, had the most population. But anyway, you see this big migration into London. So Malthus saw this, he saw this, he lived through, through this as well, and he saw this agricultural revolution. So there was this abundance in food. And he was like, it's not doing any good because we have so many poor people in London. Um, the other thing that I want to bring up is that during this time, 
there was a middle class that grew um, and they became more literate. So the first libraries happened during the Enlightenment period, again, because of the printing press, we finally had books. And an amazing thing happened uh, in France, Diderot, a man named Denise Diderot, decided to take all the science, scientific information that existed in the world and put it into an encyclopedia, what he called an encyclopedia, 17 volumes that covered everything known to man at that time. That was uh, quite an achievement. And people read these encyclopedias and people went to libraries. Um, I also have down here on the slide, uh, on the bottom left is a French salon. So people were congregating in France to discuss the ideas in these new ideas, the scientific ideas and the ideas for the enlightenment people. And on the right, I have a coffee house from England. And that's, that's where people were congregating in England to exchange ideas and work out de debate with one another. And in that way, it was a very exciting time uh, of, the, of the middle class as well as the um, upper middle class. So, uh, let's see, to review, um, well, so now the reason why Malthus is controversial today even, well, he was controversial in his time because he was against the poor laws. Um, but he's still being talked about today as well. And not just about food, but a limiting factor, like do we have enough water for all the population that we have? Will we have too much trash? Will we have enough natural resources? So it's beyond food, but people still talk about this Malthusian trap. Like if we have too much population growth, are we gonna outstrip the, the resources of the earth? So now Malthus got some things right and some things wrong. One of the things he got wrong is he did not see that we would have agricultural innovations. He said, we're done. We've had all these innovations recently in the agricultural revolution, but he didn't foresee that it would continue to happen. And in a way, I'm surprised at that because he just saw all these innovations as a good demographer. He should have realized that that could continue to happen. And in fact, we now have more food per person at seven than they had back in uh, Europe. The other thing that Malthus got wrong is that, well, first of all, it was uh, the Enlightenment period. There wasn't much birth control, if any at all. And he was a clergy of sorts. And he was saying, people are going, uh, people are just gonna continue to have children. Well, that wasn't exactly true. We've, we've got birth control and people don't always want to have children. And he thought the only hope was to delay the age of marriage. And uh, so anyway, he got that wrong because we know as people get wealthier, the wealthier societies are having um, fewer children. And uh, the other policy implication where I think he got wrong was don't help the poor. And that's wrong because you help the poor and you get them into a higher income strata and they will actually have fewer children. Now, here's some of the things that he got right. He, was a, he developed the um, math that we still have today on how to measure population growth. So he's, he was a brilliant demographer from that perspective. The other thing is he was what I call an armchair anthropologist. He read all the reports that people had of traveling to the colonies and to around the world. 
And wherever he found indigenous people in particular, he was very interested. And this is one of the things we still do today in demography. We go around and we try and evaluate what's happening with um, different societies, especially those that um, are indigenous, uh, to give us clues as to what is inherently in our humanity in terms of our uh, population growth. And the other thing he warned about, and I wanted to put this in because he sort of gets a bad rap about the population. Uh, the, uh, he gets a bad rap about the poor laws, but he actually was concerned about the Native Americans. As an indigenous population, he said, they're either going to be killed or they're going to be backed into a corner. And that is not going to allow them to have their culture. And he warned against that. Um, the other thing he did some at, at the time in England, people were using his book, which was very popular and well read at the time. Uh, they were using that in the House of Commons to argue for slavery. And he made it known that he was against slavery and not to use his, his work to, um, to promote slavery. So at least wanted to give you that. Now, there's this idea of neo-Malthusianism, which is people concerned that population growth is too great and that we are using up the Earth's resources. And really, it's a matter of, do you think the Earth's resources are finite? Are we going to outstrip them? And environmentalists will want us to limit consumption. And the question is, do we need to? And even if we need to, can we? And should we somehow limit births to reduce the population? As you know, China had the one child policy for many years and they dramatically, in some ways draconianly limited births. So, uh, so that's something for people to think about. It's still being debated today um, what about the Malthusian perspective? You know, and will that, uh, will that play out? Well, that is Malthus, the father of demography. So I hope you remember that. Um, now I want to go on to John Locke, uh, who was an early, very early Enlightenment thinker. Um, at the end of the 1600s, 1683 to 90, he wrote the two treatises of government. And he, is, he was uh, trying to get what are the natural rights of human society. And what he came up with is that all humans, all humans have the right to life, liberty, and property. And I think what he meant by property is to better yourself with materially. Um, and as you know, this got translated into our Declaration of Independence with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The second important thing he did was he talked about the social contract that you must a government is only legitimate if they have the consent of those that are governed. Now, he wasn't the only person to, uh, or the first person to talk about this. Actually, Thomas Hobbes first talked about the social contract, but Thomas Hobbes was pretty pessimistic. And he said, well, we need to have a monarchy because it'll be too wild and crazy and uh, we need kings. And John Locke was different. And John Locke said, no, we, we are actually good. We, we can manage ourselves and we don't need a strong monarchy, but whatever that government is, it should have the consent of the people. Uh, the third thing he's known for is suggesting religious tolerance. And at the time there were, um, tremendous 
wars going on between the Catholics and the Protestants. Um, and in particular, I just want to mention the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1848. And it was a brutal, brutal war. Uh, it started in Germany and uh, it, it started between a Protestant Ferdinand and a Catholic Ferdinand. And the Catholic Ferdinand was winning for quite a while. And he was, he had a Jesuit advisor and he was brutal, I wanna say evil. Like when they captured towns, they decimated them. Uh, soldiers were brutalized, uh, tortured. It was awful. Uh, and during that time, there was also a famine and there wasn't a lot of food in Germany. And so when the soldiers came by, either group of soldiers came by, they were looting and um, violent with the with the townspeople. So it was by the end of this, people were really tired of the religious wars. And I think, um, I think that helped people see that they needed religious tolerance. Uh, and John Locke was writing a little bit after that. Uh, would have, he would have heard about that. He would have been uh, he would have heard eyewitnesses, eyewitness news of that as well. So that is uh, very important parts of John Locke and the Enlightenment. And these were ideas that were very widely read, both in Europe um, and in the colonies. So I want to go on and mention Thomas Jefferson in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. These, uh, I have some quotes here from the Declaration of Independence. I'll just read for those who aren't looking at the slides. Um, but these are directly not, uh, they are inspired by Locke, if not actually written by Locke, um, they were inspired by him. All men are created equal. The inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And here's his social contract. Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Another thing John Locke was in favor of is that there should be rebellion when the government is not working. And in the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson writes, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. So definitely inspired by John Locke. And not just the Declaration of Independence, but our Bill of Rights, the right to free speech, the right to protest, religious tolerance, separation of church and state, and also due process for jury, uh, for, for those accused of crimes. All of these were new ideas in the Enlightenment period that were very eloquently stated by John Locke. Okay, now I wanna to turn to Voltaire, uh, who was quite the character very different kind of person. He was um, known for his concern about the right to a fair trial and separation of church and state. And part of all that was that he, with his political satire, he really highlighted hypocrisies and corruption, both in the church and in the monarchy. And because he was so powerful in his writing, he got into a lot of trouble, as you might imagine, uh, because in Paris, in France, they did not have the freedom of speech um, and the right to protest and so on 
that they actually did in England. England was farther ahead than the rest of Europe in that, in that way. So here's a little bit about him. He was a, he wrote in many different ways. He was a poet, a playwright, and a novelist. And he was also a scientist for much of his life. He took Isaac Newton's work and he popularized it. He made it understandable. He actually spent a year in the Bastille because he made uh, the monarchy upset with the poem that he wrote. Uh, he became independently wealthy because he made uh, clever financial investments. Uh, so this left him free to just write, 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 write. And he also was able to travel and get out of Paris where he was um, getting in trouble. His books were burned by the church. Um, he never married, but he was definitely a ladies man. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, his famous novel is Candide, which he wrote when he was 65 years old. I wanna tell you that I read that book about 15 years ago, and it makes fun of the optimism and his fellow philosophers. And when I, I'm, I consider myself an optimistic person and I got very upset and angry at his book. So he's able, his writing was really powerful to, have, to get a reaction like that from me. So I can imagine how the monarchy and the church felt when he was making fun of them as well. But by the end, he definitely won the hearts of the French people. He actually, uh, after spending a year in the Bastille, he went to England and uh, stayed there for a while. And he actually didn't return to Paris until the very end of his life. Um, here's some fun facts about him. I told you he, he popularized Isaac Newton. Well, this story that we all know about how Isaac Newton knows about gravity is because an apple fell on his head. Well, uh, Voltaire heard that story from a relative of Newton's after Newton died and he popularized that. So we all know about Voltaire because we know about the apple and Isaac Newton. Um, I put a coffee cup here. I told you he was highly prolific. Rumor had it, he drank 40 cups of coffee a day. So sometimes that's what it takes. Um, I have some books burning here. As I told you early, he, his books were, were, banned, were banned and burned. And rumor has it, he said, better the books be burned than the man. So he learned to get out of the way. And finally, I have a woman here, the Marquis de Chatelet. And it turns out that he had, uh, he lived with her for 16 years. They were lovers. She was married to a high noble um, and it was very acceptable, I guess, at the time for him to, um, for him to do this because the husband would join them in the castle as well from time to time. But the interesting thing about her is that she was his intellectual equal. They would do experiments together. They would discuss, uh, they wrote papers in scientific journals together. Uh, she was... Uh, quite a, an enlightenment thinker herself. She died in childbirth, um, not from his child, but from someone else. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and, and then he moved on. He, but he was very committed to her. And that was, uh, they say, the happiest time of his life was when he was with her. Now to know Voltaire is really to know of what he said because he was so funny. And you'll see some political, um, see the politics and how he thought. So I have some quotes that I wanna share with you 
of Voltaire. He says, he writes, it is forbidden to kill. Therefore, all murderers are punished unless they kill in large numbers and to the sound of trumpets. So that's his anti-war statement. If God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. And similarly, if God has made us in his image, we have returned him the favor. So you can get a sense of how, how clever he was. It is dangerous to be right in matters on which the established authorities are wrong. Cherish those who seek the truth, but beware of those who find it. Those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. So there's, I wanted to share that of Voltaire, and I, am, I encourage you to seek out other quotes of Voltaire and maybe even uh, check out Candide, which is uh, still a popular novel today. All right, so now I wanna, so that was my talk about the three thinkers, and now I want to just recap some of the key points. Um, the church and monarchy ruled for 900 years after the fall of Rome, and some of the things that got us out of that feudal system was the Black Plague, the printing press, and the Protestant Reformation. Then we ushered in the Renaissance period, and the Techniques of the Renaissance period, basically science and the scientific method, were then applied to political and social reform during the Enlightenment. The agricultural revolution was very important because it provided more food per person and it also resulted in mass migration of peasants from the countryside into the cities. Religious tolerance and separation of church and state made even more sense after the brutal, vicious 30 years war. And I believe Amer I think we all, most people, most historians would agree that American democracy owes much to the enlightenment philosophs, as they were called, philosophers, and especially to John Locke. I know this was a lot of information to take in, and I want to invite you to remember a few things. Um, sometimes terrible tragedies, like the Black Plague and the Thirty Years' War, actually help advance civilizations. And so I know with COVID right now, we have a lot of deaths, and I hope there will be good that comes out of it. So these you know, I don't think we'll ever end, and uh, we'll, we'll never stop tragedies, but hopefully we can take advantage of them. And thinking about Moth Mothis, uh, thinking about population and the sustainable use of Earth's resources is still an important balancing act, not just in Mothis's time, but even, maybe even more so now that we have 7.5 billion people on the planet. American democracy was an experiment, and it's a, real, it's a relatively new form of government when you take the long view. And I think we got uh, a lesson in that on January 6th when uh, there was a threat to the peaceful transfer of power. It's still, we're still working on it. Um, and when I think about Voltaire, I think about using humor may be the most effective way to change the world. And finally, studying history can, at least I feel that when I study history, it makes me grateful for what we have now in humanity's progress. So I hope when you think about this, the history of this time, uh, you'll, you'll remember things like this. 
So Steve, back to you. <laughs> There's you, a lot Sherry. of talking. <laughs> yeah, well, great job. It was a good overview of, uh, of enlightenment ideas and some of the principal players there. And, you know, what's interesting is how uh, all that intersects with, uh, with the art world as well. And, uh, and we see, uh, you know, none of these things happening uh, in a, some kind of bubble on their own, right? There's a, there, there is influences going back and forth. And so, uh, as we've all been talking about in these uh, last few lectures, it's uh, how Mozart was trying to deal with the, all, of, all of these newer ideas and, and his, his ability to go out and become his own kind of a musician without the patronage of a, of a the yes, you know, an aristocrat. Yeah. yeah, you know, one of the things he had is that he was getting he needed to make money, obviously, and the church, uh, the clergy, the church was his or the monarchy were the two places that he was trying to get money, to get his money from, but he was then trying to go to the middle class or the upper middle class and get to become a tutor and uh, give public concerts and things of that sort. So it was right in that transition period between the monarchy and the and the church versus uh, the general society. Uh, and did, is this is this the time period when the middle class started to exist? Would it uh, yes. was, it, was the rise of the middle class? Yes, the yeah. rise of the middle class or the bourgeoisie. Yeah. Right, right. The, yeah. Those who had uh, skilled labor and and uh, those who had the means to to kind of pull themselves out of the the general poverty of the of the earlier uh, time periods, right? So uh, it, it seems to make sense then that that we start to have public concerts and and people are are wanting to hear music and see art and all of these things that had been really reserved for the elite, and uh, and that left a lot of space for for someone to, to start that and uh, so yeah it's, it's a it's a very interesting look at all of these things from a different perspective any questions from anyone out there in the chat or you can raise your hand here marisol um, oh sorry i was gonna ask something but i'll raise my hand hi i just had um two questions i wanted to confirm when you were speaking about the 17 volume encyclopedia, that was something that was accomplished by the middle class? No, it was uh, accomplished by this man named Diderot with some of the other thinkers from the enlightenment period. Diderot did a lot of the writing himself. But what I wanted to say is the middle class was interested in reading the encyclopedia. So it was very popular. And the population was very literate and they were very interested in reading and learning and becoming more educated. Okay. And then the second question I had was, um, I, I think I'm pronouncing this right, Marquise? Moffis. No, or, no. Um, or Vol Voltaire's. Uh, Voltaire. Voltaire's um, lover. Her name was Marquise. Oh, yeah. Marquise, the Marquis de Chatelet. And who was she married to? Uh, the guy whose last name is Chatelet too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you had used a specific word. You said a, um, a high. I mean, he was a nobleman. You know, nobleman. He had a castle. Okay. He had a couple residences. So Voltaire and her went off to live in their castle in the countryside. And he, the husband came and went. And he was like proud that she was with someone like Voltaire. Thank you. Jameson. Um, okay. Um, I just looked it up and, and the uh, uh, husband's name was Louis Marie Florent du Chalet or something. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, um, but I had a couple of questions about Malthus mm -hmm. and then something about the 30 years war. Um, so, so did Malthus have any predictions about running out of living space? And was he looking at places 
like London and, and thinking that cities would become too overcrowded to support people? You know, I, I don't recall that. I don't think okay. he was looking at space. It was more food. Okay. But, but the Neo-Malthusian perspective would say, yeah, we have to worry about space. I just think other it would limiting be, factors. Yeah, I just think it would be funny if he, he just wrote a paper and was like, yeah, so there's no, not going to be enough space on uh, the British Isles for people after 200 years. Um, and then did, did he ever speak about the bubonic plague and the effects it had and whether or not that was a good thing within his model? Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know that he, well, he wouldn't say it was a good thing. And I don't think he would have said that it stopped feudalism, but he might have pointed to the fact that it happened because there wasn't enough food supply. So he was looking at that kind of history to say that there are these tragedies that keep happening when there's not enough food. Okay. But I, I don't specifically know whether he mentioned the bubonic plague or not. But okay. I, I don't, he would not have said it stopped feudalism. I don't think he had that perspective on it. Um, and then, so the 30 years war, did that last for 230 years? No, well, the 30 years, well, there were so many different wars and they talk about whether it's really just 30 years, but oh, okay. there's a specific 30 year war, 30 year period, um, 1618 to 1648, specifically in Germany uh, with the King of Bohemia it started in 1816 and it lasted oh. just 30 years. Did I say 230? I, I, I apologize. I, I think I read 30. the uh, six as an eight and I was like, well, that doesn't sound right. Oh, okay. <laughs> On your slide, I think, it, I think I read 1848 instead of 1648. My bad. Oh, maybe I put the wrong thing on. Yeah. Anyway, sorry if I did. Yeah. All the uh, European wars and, and history can become pretty convoluted, right? There's this alliance here and this alliance there and and uh, I was just reading about the Habsburgs and their, all of their holdings. And they, you know, at one time that they hated each other, the French, and the, then, then all of a sudden they liked the French and then they were somewhat indifferent to the French. And, you know, it just went on and on and on. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, one of the interesting things on the Thirty Years' War is that the Catholic French aligned with the Protestants against the Catholic Ferdinand because he was taking up too much property. And he was getting too powerful. So it wasn't just a religious war. It, it was also a political one. Yeah, yeah. They, they said a lot about the Protestant Reformation, that that was a, a big political move by the king of uh, Bohemia. It was, you know, they, they were really trying to separate themselves from the, the and form a more secular government. So yeah, it's just, it's, it's very interesting as you get into it and you can get really lost into in some of these things too as well. Any yes. other questions tonight from anyone? If <laughs> I want to review this, do I have to go find the recorded video or can I, uh, I mean, review specifically the PowerPoint that was provided? Could I get that or do I just need to go watch the recorded video? Well, the recorded video will be up uh, probably by Sunday, so you can see it there. And it's up to Shelly if she wants to share that with you guys or not. If she does, I'll post it up in, in our classroom for you. Yes, I'm just going to correct. You guys are right. It said 30 years were 1618 to 1848. It was 1648. Sorry about that typo. So I'll correct the typo, and then, uh, and then uh, we can, uh, you can share it. Thank you. All right, so we need a code word for tonight. Shelly, I usually ask people what their favorite dessert is. Okay, I'm prepared. Okay. <laughs> I what don't is... eat sugar. Oh, well. <laughs> but, okay. but I eat pecans and I love them. So my favorite dessert is pecans. Pecans. The code word for tonight is pecans. You will include that with your synopsis of 250 words or more not less. 
for credit for tonight. Jameson, another question. Oh, is my hand still up? I'm sorry. Uh, um, right. But funnily enough, I do have another question. Um, so were you a demographer back when the, who was it 2008 or 2009 market crash occurred? I was. Um, were there any predictions at the time or, or what, what were your thoughts for like movement throughout the country in terms of like people moving from like the East Coast or the West Coast more inwards or more inwards to coastal cities or leaving the country? Did you have any predictions at the time as to what would happen there? Did I personally have any predictions? No, I, you know, I wasn't studying that per se. I was living through it, however. Um, our, all of our house values went down during the time. Uh, but, um, you know, there, were, there was a lot of talk about people leaving California then too, but California's housing prices stayed pretty steady compared to the rest of the country. And I don't think it stopped the migration into California. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what you're asking about. Is that, am I? I no, that covered it, what? thank you. Kasia, mm. yeah, do you have a question? Um, okay. Are there any demo dem demographers that you would recommend us reading if we wanted to, I don't know, stay up to date on what's going on, especially with numbers concerning COVID? and effects that that might have on economy, population, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, I just have some friends who study it and they gave some seminars at UC Berkeley. There's a demography department at UC Berkeley and they actually give classes in uh, demography as well. Um, and they have a Wednesday noon seminar uh, that anybody can join. It's, it's on Zoom now. Um, and that's where I first heard about the COVID discussion and mortality rates. Um, but let's see who, yeah, there isn't anyone that I can point to in the popular literature or anything that I'd suggest. Um, Yeah, I just would say Google demography, demographic trends, and there'll be a lot to, uh, to read about. I do want to say, you know, because I brought up about my friends doing this seminar, they said that a million deaths in the U.S. was likely, was the middle case. You know, it was anywhere from 200,000 to 2 million, but a million was their middle guess for the number of deaths if there was no vaccine. So, I mean, you know, we're at 500,000 right now. And hopefully because of the vaccine, it'll be slowing down. I didn't really answer your question. I'm sorry, I don't really have any suggestions on specific demographers. It's okay, thank you. I will definitely look into the UC Berkeley um, thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you're interested in demography or think maybe you'd have a, you're interested in a prof, uh, looking to a profession in demography, I would definitely look at UC Berkeley's demography department and see what class offerings they have and take a class and see if it interests you. Other questions tonight? No. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was good to see you this evening. And we'll be back next week with, uh, with another uh, uh, lecture in our series. And hope you can join us for that. Those of you that this is your last lecture with us uh, for the class, uh, thank you very much for coming to these. And of course, you're welcome to, to show up for any of the others that you'd like to. Everyone is welcome. And please help me thank Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. <laughs> Thanks. Come on, Eliana. You're gonna go watch that camera, baby. Okay.
<laughs> nice job, Shelly. <laughs> Are you familiar with this demographer, Steven Pinker? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, he's a popular one. Yeah. Yeah. He's written several books. He's kind of an interesting read. Yes. Very controversial. Yeah. Yeah. He's an optimist, right? He would be uh, in the optimist camp, I think. Yeah. Or not. I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't know his so. work. I've just heard people talk about him. Yeah. Well, I guess if you're, if you're any good, you have to be a little controversial. Yes, those, are the those are the examples you gave us tonight anyway yes <laughs> yeah okay. all right we've got a lot of all activity right. now <laughs> sounds like it okay all right. well i'll hang out here for a while thanks again shelly and okay. have a all good right. evening okay. oh, oh, this one Hello, Paul. Hello. How are, how are you? Good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Jennifer oh. says hi too. Oh, hi, Jennifer. We we both watched here uh, running my phone off the TV. Larger than life. <laughs> That's scary. Are any of your students still here? Are any of my students still here? It looks like there are. are Three others, Three others still on. Still on. I had a question, but it wasn't about the lecture. Well, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> Is that wallpaper behind you? Oh, it's fabric. Oh, it's fabric. That's oh, beautiful. It's fabric. Oh, well, you, you have to. You have to tell Tracy that. Tell Tracy it's, that. It's, we found it at this little, at this um, little uh, I think, uh, uh, like a Turkish, uh, like a Turkish fabric, fabric shop, shop in Alameda. In Alameda. And, and it was kind of like a scrap, kind of like a scrap you know, rolled up, rolled in, a up in a box out in front out in of the, front uh, of the uh, storefront. Wow, that's great. I will tell her. Yeah. 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 She, did, she, did, the, she did this room because she did not like what I had done with it. <laughs> Which room? We couldn't Which figure out what room it is. What room are you in? Oh, it's a, one, oh, of the it's little, a one, one of our bedrooms. One of our bedrooms. Okay. That I used to as a study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, good to see you. Yeah, good, good to see you. Good to see you guys too. Paul, are you up Paul, next week? I, I have to look no, up. two weeks. I'm the twenty fourth. All right. Okay. Looking forward right. to that. Forward to that. Yep. I am looking forward to it myself. All right. Well, All you right. guys have All a good right. evening. Have a good evening. You See you later. Nice to you. Dino, are you still here, still Tristan? Still here. Tristan, Dino, I'm going to leave unless you have a question. <laughs>